everybody. Um, this is Fulvio Fontini. As you can see in the first slide, I'm, I am a professor of economics at the University of Padua in Italy. And uh, at the same time, I'm also co-chair of the Electricity Security of Supply Task Force set up uh, by the CER and ACER together. Um, our today presentation will be on the internal electricity market and on the directive, um, on the first of the three directives that set up the third energy package, the directive 2009-72, and on the activity of um, reporting um, on the internal market. Indeed, we shall focus on the multi-level approach um, uh, laid down by the directive um, and that is followed by the institutions and bodies that have been set up by the third energy package for the target to reach the internal energy market uh, and the report of um, and the um, reporting activity uh, on it. Um, the, uh, more precisely, we will, follow, we will follow the following um, steps. The presentation will be divided in three steps. Um, the first part we will discuss about the uh, top-down and bottom-up approach that uh, is followed in, uh, at the European level uh, to, to reach the internal energy market target by the bodies uh, set up by the third energy package, in particular ACER, EMSOs, um, and so E for electricity, and the so-called regional initiatives. Um, the second part of the presentation will discuss briefly about the so-called target models for the electricity sector, in particular the four target models, the market coupling, the cost board initial A, the long term transmission rights and the capacity calculation. And the third uh, part of the presentation will discuss the monitoring activity, uh, both what it is about, and we will also see some results of the monitoring of the internal energy market um, uh, completion by um, activity, which is an activity run by ASA. Now, um, what are the um, what, what, how, what what can you say about the top-down and bottom-up approach uh, to to market integration? Well, the, the, the purpose of market integration is to to bring the benefit uh, to consumers and industries uh, by enhancing efficiency of the market, basically. Uh, for this purpose. Uh, the third energy package, um, uh, so the directive 2009-72, but also the 73, the other directives and the regulation that all together form the third energy package, um, has set up a set of rules, procedures, and bodies that are in charge of uh, uh, reaching this target. I should add, perhaps, that um, uh, we will shall focus more precisely on electricity only and on the internal energy market target. The third energy package is a broader concept, and I would refer you to have a look at the uh, webinar of last week, which is available. Uh, there is a link also here, if you are interested in having a more a broader view of um, the third energy package as a whole. Now, um, so the rationale of um, um, of the approach set up by the, the 2009-73 directive um, is to uh, set up, is to, to implement, to define and implement a set of rules which refer to um, all time frames for the uh, electric, electricity uh, sector, uh, for the um, production chain. Um, for the electricity supply chain, sorry, and for all, and this all, which is also horizontal, so which applies to all uh, member states and countries um, together, uh, by setting a set of um, a specific procedure, in particular defining framework guidelines by ACER, implementing network codes by NSOE uh, upon approval by ACER, and uh, implementation by um, the Parliament and the Commission through the comitology phase. So this can be defined uh, as a top-down approach uh, of the regulation uh, towards the, um, uh, uh, the target of the internal energy market. Set of rules that apply uh, horizontally to all countries and vertically to all time frames. However, 
uh, at the time of the entry into force of the third energy package uh, and uh, um, still now, there, there used to be and are still partially also now present, um, also another approach which comes from uh, um, local initiatives uh, set up by several state or, uh, stakeholders. Um, in particular, there were some initiatives uh, put forth um, by um, PSOs, NRAs, and uh, power exchanges um, that uh, had the aim to foster integration in, uh, locally um, towards, uh, in, in order to enhance efficiency and bring benefits. Um, in particular, those initiatives started with uh, reference to cross-border issues which, because the, those were the most natural elements that were taken into account when there was a need to um, put together um, cross-border parties interested in cross-border issues. Um, but they moved also towards other um, frames and topics. Um, to be more precise, uh, the, there was a body called ERGEG, uh, European Regulatory Group on Energy and Gas, on Electricity and Gas, uh, which uh, was then um, terminated by the third energy package and some of uh, its competencies were transmitted to ACER. Uh, but ERGEG, at the time it was um, uh, still um, an active body in the regulatory framework of Europe, uh, launched in 2006 uh, several regional initiatives. And the aim was exactly to bring together uh, all the stakeholders to foster integration at regional level. So what effectively ERGEG did is, was that it identified um, several um, regions, uh, and for these regions um, specified uh, the set up those initiatives in order to, to, to enhance uh, market integration. Um, those regional, electricity uh, regional initiatives were seven. Uh, which um, included um, all the member states uh, of the European Union um, by then. Uh, you might, in particular, there was the Baltic Regional Initiative, the Central East, Central South, Central West, Northern, Southwest, and UK and Ireland together with France. Uh, obviously, the, you can you can easily see that the um, the, 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 the reason of splitting these regional initiatives uh, among the seven uh, was due to the network topology of electricity uh, at that time, um, and so that the cross-border issues were effectively the more relevant ones, uh, the one that involved those countries um, region by region. You can also see that, uh, in a mathematical term, regional initiatives are not a partition of the um, uh, European Union, in the sense that there were countries that participated more than one, uh, because effectively uh, they were the, the topology of the network and the topology of the problem, so to say, um, refer to more than one border and more than one. Uh, region. In particular, you can have a look at the central role played in, uh, Euro, in, in Europe by Germany, the participate to four regional initiatives, uh, Austria, um, Italy, uh, and so on. Okay. Now, uh, these regional initiatives uh, coexist with the top-down approach. Uh, so there is an important point that, to some extent, puzzle those who are not too familiar with the regulatory approach of Europe is that um, the, 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 the top-down approach, the one set up by the directive um, that I spelled out before, effectively is complementary or is complemented by the bottom-up one. And they still co um, cooperate. Uh, there are uh, there is room for um, and need for cooperation and proper 
uh, tables where this cooperation takes place, some of the competencies of um, the bottom-up approach, and in particular some of the competencies of the regional initiatives, were, were observed by ACES, for instance, uh, but some other still uh, are in place. Uh, in particular, the competencies on cross-border flow uh, were taken by ACE uh, through its um, network uh, framework guidance and network uh, activities, but some other competencies still are in place and, uh, and, and uh, regional initiatives play an important role because these are four that put together several stakeholders, not just PSOs, but um, also power exchanges and NRAs. Uh, um, at the regional level, okay? In particular, there is an important activity which is put forth by the Northwest region, uh, the, uh, the, the price coupling, which encompasses also the other regions. So is the activity to um, foster market coupling. I will discuss briefly what it is about. Uh, for all the bidding areas within several uh, regions, um, in particular, the Central West region, the Northern, the Baltic, and the Britain, using a single, single algorithm to clear the market. The, this activity is, uh, is called the, so -called, the price coupling of regions, and this activity is still put forward by the regional initiatives. So, um, we've seen that this top down approach, uh, setting rules with effect time frames in all countries and uh, the bottom up uh, putting forth initiatives at the regional level uh, on, on which refer to those rules set up by the top down and also others um, coexist in the uh, regulatory framework of Europe. Um, however, regulators realized soon that um, by implementing the top-down approach, uh, there was a risk of a fragmented picture uh, of regulation of the electricity supply chain. In particular, um, the, the framework guidelines and natural codes uh, um, affect specific parts of the um, uh, of the electricity supply chain. They could be grouped in three big areas, network codes correlated to connection and transmission, and network codes which refer to system operation and market related network codes. But however, uh, by specifying specific parts of the um, supply chain, there was the risk of losing a comprehensive view of a market. In order to avoid this risk and to deliver a set of uh, coordinated uh, global um, regulation for all the relevant uh, time frames of the electricity supply chain, um, target models were defined. So the, um, the uh, target of all the regulation, top down and bottom up, was clearly specified. Uh, for all time frames. And these are what we call the target models. In particular, as I said, um, there are four target models that refer to the different time frames that one can think about in delivering electricity. Um, there is the target model for, of market coupling that refers to the day ahead market, the wholesale market. Uh, the cross border intraday, which refers to the intraday um, time frame. The long-term transmission right target model, which refers to long-term, as the name specifies itself. And the capacity calculation, which refers to the sometimes time in which there is a need to specify the transmit the available capacity and manage congestion on the grid. Okay? So now let us briefly review these four target models and what they um, refer about. The target model of market coupling. Um, what is market coupling? Uh, we can say that market coupling is the integration of the several markets uh, through an implicit allocation of cross-border capacity. Uh, in particular, there is a single algorithm among the several bidding zones that uh, clears the market, the same market rules uh, for all the markets involved in the market coupling, uh, and the capacity the cross-border capacity would then be used on the basis of its implicit value, meaning 
the value of the capacity is transmitting electricity, so it is the price differential among the zones uh, that should uh, signal where it is worthwhile or where it is more valued the capacity for electricity transmission. Um, let me make a quick example uh, to, to specify what market coupling is uh, very quickly. Suppose there are two zones, for instance, the zone A, which is a net energy import, and the zone B, which is a net energy exporter. Um, if there is no market coupling, then each zone has its own rules. And if, for instance, in zone B, a uh, producer wants to export electricity, they need to acquire the transmission capacity and specify that that transmission capacity from zone B to zone A will be used to um, uh, deliver electricity from zone B to zone A. This is called nomination. Uh, typically, nomination occurs beforehand, so before the real time, in order to let the TSO to have, um, uh, which are the TSOs of the two markets, to have sufficient time to clear the market, to, to specify the market topology according to the uh, expected usage of the grid. Now, market coupling is basically um, um, the uh, economic merit order of all zones. So, with market coupling, which requires the same rules uh, across zones, the same vol, same gate closure, same market clean rules, and so on. Um, there will be an operator that clears the markets as if they uh, of the two zones as if they were just one, uh, on the basis of the merit order of the offers. And then uh, the excess supply of zone B would be used to cover excess demand in zone A. If there is enough transmission capacity, as a result, we will have a single uh, price among these zones. Um, and in this case, we would say that the price markets are coupled. Uh, it can occur that um, there is not enough transmission capacity. Uh, so in that case, we would observe a different a price differential among um, uh, among the two zones. In this case, we say that the market is split, but still uh, using the same um, market clearing logic, the same market clearing algorithm, the same rules. So even when with market coupling, it can happen that prices do not uh, converge. But what does not happen is that. Uh, pri uh, capacity is used against prices. So it cannot be that in zone B uh, electricity so capacity is used to, to in the example I'm making, uh, electricity is used to, to, to export energy from zone A and zone B. If zone A is an net important, zone B is an net export, and as a result, price in A is higher than, um, than in B. Okay, the target is to reach uh, market coupling for all Europe through the progressive implementation of the price coupling of region, the example I've made before. Let us quickly review the other target models. For the intraday, uh, the intraday, I'm sure all, all of you know, is the time frame which uh, starts from when the wholesale market closed till the delivery time. And the target of regulation is to get towards a system of continuous trading um, uh, of intraday markets uh, and uh, um, al allowing for uh, using the, again, the price coupling, the implicit mechanism, uh, in order to allow for hedging the price differentials throughout all time from the uh, wholesale uh, till uh, um, the delivery time. The target model for um, long-term transmission rights is to use, uh, so the so long term is a year ahead and, and more, is to uh, trade uh, financial transmission rights or physical transmission rights. Uh, but the case in case of physical transmission rights, so the target mode in this case does not specify a single model both financial and physical transmission rights. The only constraint is that in the case of physical transmission rights, there should be a use it or sell it condition in order to prevent uh, um, negative consequences on uh, or, or, or to give market power to some bodies. Uh, exception can be um, accepted, for instance, for the North, uh, northern region, which is a, a region that um, is extremely liquid uh, and there's 
there are financial hedging products um, that are in place. Uh, they can be those financial products can continue to be used uh, um, uh, instead of uh, um, transmission rights on the long-term capacity. And finally, the target model for um, capacity calculation, which is uh, based on the flow-based um, method, the capacity calculation method. In particular, the flow-based is basically um, an algorithm that takes into account the scheduled um, uh, commercial uh, trades uh, uh, and, and clears uh, and specifies the energy at all nodes and, the, um, and as a consequence, the um, transmission capacity given the power or load at all nodes predetermined, predefined by the commercial schedule, the effective capacity that can be transmitted uh, among, on the transmission lines at all nodes um, in effecting, effectively between zones, not nodes, but zones. Uh, so calculating endogenously the available transmission capacity. The alternative from this is the, as I said, is the nomination. Um, so a, a commercial amount would have to be um, defined and uh, uh, acquired somehow by some auction mechanism or whatever, and then each uh, owner of this capacity would have to nominate, namely specifying that we need to use the capacity. But the problem in this is that uh, this commercial capacity is typically less than the one that are, um, arises uh, through the um, flow base, and there can be uh, wrong nominations. Uh, so the target is the, using the flow based um, uh, capacity calculation. Uh, those target models are all important uh, in the view of the um, uh, regulation towards the internal energy market, uh, but perhaps meaningfully, uh, the, the priority so far on the implementation of network codes has been given to the um, uh, capacity allocation congestion management uh, network codes within the um, within the capacity calculation target model, uh, which is again a set of harmonized rules uh, that specifies how the capacity emission capacity has to be calculated throughout Europe, uh, and how the congestion of the uh, of that capacity has to be managed in case uh, there are bugs that are congested. Um, now. Uh, these are, this is the approach that has been identified, so the, let me repeat, the use of top-down and bottom-up approach, the cooperation of regional initiatives together with the bodies, ASA and so and so set up by the top-down approach, uh, the definition of the target model and the implementation of the target model to the set of different time frames. This is the approach that in Europe has been identified to, uh, towards the completion of the internet energy market in order to enhance efficiency being um, the benefit to consumers. However, there is also and regulators uh, and, and, and uh, laws clearly had in mind that the, um, there is also the need to monitor the, this process and to see to what extent it is effective in bringing the uh, efficiency to, to consumers. Um, this competence uh, refers to the market monitoring activity and has been set up in the third energy package and attributed to ACER. Uh, in particular, Article 11 of Regulation 713 specifies that ACER has to monitor the market, uh, the, the market uh, um, having in mind the completion of the internal energy market targets. Uh, ACER does this activity together, as we, like we have seen in the last uh, lecture, and we will more clearly see in another webinar next week. ACER runs this activity together with CR and so together with NRAs and all the bodies involved in the um, uh, regulatory framework uh, of uh, electricity in Europe. Now, uh, the, result, the result of this uh, um, monitoring activity, uh, which, by the way, let me open a parenthesis, has to be intended as different 
from monitoring the market to prevent, in order to prevent uh, uh, abuse, uh, market abuse, uh, uh, or to guarantee market integrity, which is called uh, following another directive, which is called the remit. Uh, that activity is also a tributary, but it's something different. This is just the uh, picture, a, a fact checking on the integration of the internal energy market and on the step towards the progress toward, uh, on the step of uh, the um, are implemented towards this target. The result of this market monitoring activity is a report, it's a market monitoring report. The ASA issues uh, every year, um, around the end of November or so, uh, for the uh, year before. Two market monitoring reports have been issued so far. Um, what I, we shall do now in the rest of this webinar is to uh, briefly review some of the results of the market monitoring activity of the latest available report, which refers to electricity and energy gas markets in 2015. I will focus only on uh, electricity, except when the slides provided by the market monitoring report refer to both, uh, in which case you will also have figures and facts about gas. Um, I would use everybody interested uh, to have a look at the market monitoring report uh, because it's really interesting. It's long, it's full of uh, analysis and uh, data and uh, evaluations. Uh, it's a lot of uh, food for thought, so to say. Um, obviously, it's extremely rich. We will not review it here. It's, it would, be, would require a fully dedicated set of webinars, perhaps. We'll just focus on some uh, elements, which I think are relevant to uh, describe to you how the top-down and bottom-up regulations are taking place, what are still the problems in Europe, and, and what can we say about the integration of internal energy market. In particular, we shall focus on three um, elements, on the retail markets, uh, on the wholesale market and network access, and then the consumer protection of empowerment. These are the sections in which the market monitoring report is, uh, is um, split. Uh, in each section, there is a ch there are chapters on electricity and chapter on gas. We'll just focus on some elements of the electricity chapter in each of these sections. OK, what are uh, retail markets? Um, it's, a, it's a fundamental topic of, also for the Commission. It's perhaps the next step of uh, the regulatory um, trend in Europe. Uh, next webinar we also talk about the future, the so-called energy union, and the crucial element of the new set of regulations which will come will refer to uh, retail markets. Uh, in the market monitoring report, a huge effort has been undertaken to um, to compare different retail markets in Europe. So, um, because uh, there are different rules on the retail market and, and different uh, outcomes. So even the very standardization of the analysis is um, it's complex, it's a, it's a very complex task. Uh, and some findings uh, have been reported. Uh, in particular, let me preempt what you will see in the next slide. Um, the first finding is that there are very different retail prices across your uh, member states. And they are rising even in a period in which the economic crisis uh, would uh, have pushed the primary energy source price down. Uh, and this is mostly due to the uh, known energy component of the retail prices. This is effectively what this picture shows. So you can see that the Asia has done remarkably huge effort to disentangle um, uh, prices in uh, post-tax prices and pre-tax prices. Um, for other industry, this refer to electricity. There are also analysis for gas, but I will not report here. And we can see that there is a very a huge difference in, in uh, retail prices. Uh, oh, and this difference uh, can just partially be explained by uh, taxes. Uh, which are differently divided in different countries, but still the, also the energy prices uh, uh, are quite different. Obviously, higher for consumers than for industrial, um, for household consumers than for industrial consumers. 
and perhaps even more volatile for in households and for industrial consumers. As I said before, these energy components, uh, uh, these, these prices have been increasing over time, and this has been due to the increase on the non-contestable part, meaning uh, the non-energy part of, uh, um, of the final price, including taxes, which has been rising over time, uh, while the energy component uh, uh, has been either rising or decreasing, and this is still surprising because, as I said, uh, this is happening. Uh, this has happened in a period in which the primary energy source price has been decreasing. So we have a picture of the market, which are effectively still at the retail level, far to be integrated, uh, which perhaps justifies the the focus of the Commission towards the next uh, round of uh, regulation on on retail. As well. Uh, the second element I want to put to, to, to describe on, um, on this is that the um, renewable support is uh, the weight of renewable support on the retail price is unevenly distributed uh, in Europe as well. And for some countries, it's a significant, it's a relevant part. And you can see this in this interesting slide which disentangle the retail cost for, consume, for households uh, by trying to standardize the offers made by companies, by like different companies uh, throughout member states. And having done this standardization, disentangling the component of this offer into uh, the energy component, uh, the taxes, um, the network components, uh, and the uh, charges for renewables. And you can see that the energy component, uh, as you probably know, uh, for retail uh, consumers is, uh, is less than 50 per less than four, is slightly more than 40 percent on average in Europe, uh, with a very different situation throughout the state. Um, have a look at the network uh, component, which in some cases is huge, um, and also the um, charge for renewable support which is very different among member states, and obviously refer, uh, refers and denotes also the different uh, penetration of renewables in the, in the different markets. OK. Um, retail competition uh, also is uh, unevenly distributed uh, among member states. And this graph is um, striking. You can have you have on this graph on the right hand uh, side column the Hirschman Alpha Bay Index is a measure of uh, competition in the market. Uh, when the result is between 1,000 and 2,000, roughly 1,500 of this index, you can say that the market is sufficiently competitive. And if it's above the 2,000, the market is non competitive. Uh, the 10,000 HHI measure measure the situation of monopoly, pure monopoly. So you can see that um, for the electricity, we can identify kind of two groups of countries. Some countries in which there seems to be a more competitive uh, uh, trend in uh, retail electricity markets. Um, it's also witnessed by the, um, the concentration ratio, left and uh, left and side column. Um, and some other countries in which uh, the uh, competition, the competitive pressure on the retail side is much less developed. Uh, this is also, this is perhaps also due and uh, affects as well what we'll see in the next slide, which, are, which refers to the switching rates, because the switching behavior, so leaving the, the operator at the stand that makes you the offer that you are with, with for some other operator, typically is leaving the incumbent uh, for some other operator, but not only. Um, and the switching rates, again, are very unevenly distributed among member states. Uh, some signal a more competitive pressure in some countries, uh, Norway, um, uh, Portugal, Belgium, Great Britain, and some other countries. Uh, there's a very limited switching or not now was switching uh, uh, at all. Okay, for wholesale markets, uh, the network, uh, the market monitoring report is reaching a lot of analysis. 
I want to focus on some parts that we have been discussing before, in particular on the um, on the progress on the day ahead price convergence, so the market coupling, uh, the, the, the result of the market coupling and the process of the market coupling itself. Uh, the market monitoring report pays a lot of effort, uh, a lot of uh, a, a lot, a big part, a major part of the market monitoring report is dedicated to this section uh, for two fundamental reasons, because it's the one in which uh, the cross-border analysis is, uh, plays a fundamental part, uh, and also uh, because uh, um, uh, there is a requirement to, by the regulation, to specify on the network access and the affected network access. Uh, um, which has been specified in the article that uh, gives the power of market monitoring to uh, uh, Article 11 of uh, Regulation 713. So, uh, progress in the price convergence in the regions. So, this picture is quite nice. It also shows you the, what I was telling you before, the coexistence between uh, top-down and the bottom-up approach. You see that there are regions. Uh, and on these regions, the introduction of the market code um, of the target model on towards um, um, price coupling uh, determine a very different shape of uh, effective uh, uh, price integration uh, among the countries. In particular, you can see that the southwest, uh, re southwest Europe, Europe region is the one for which the prices are mostly integrated. Um, almost all, most for most of the time, price uh, converge. There is a single price, or there are very limited price differences. Uh, in some other regions, um, like uh, in the Central Eastern Europe, uh, there is a limited integration. Uh, or in the Central South Europe, there is no full integration. Uh, zero full price convergence. Um, price, in this slide, the, the, the full or limited price convergence refers to the average difference in prices per hour. Um, and you can also notice some interesting trends. For instance, the decrease in the price convergence in the central west uh, region um, due to several factors, but mostly due to the renewable penetration in Germany. Um, which has depressed the uh, German, uh, German prices, and it's higher in Germany com compared to um, uh, the renewable penetration compared to the other countries, the neighboring countries' penetration. So there's more volatile the energy price in Germany as a concept, and there is less uh, um, market coupling, uh, lower price convergence. Uh, uh, and also the, um, the partial phasing out, uh, temporary phasing out of nuclear power capacity in France and Belgium uh, for inspection, which has determined a big price divergence from 2011 onward in the first of the West region. Uh, but still, the picture is a picture in which there are some markets that are progressively going towards integration and some markets which are far from reaching a sufficient level of integration. Um, market coupling can be measured by, uh, as I said, percentage of hours in which the nomination of the capacity for those markets in which there is no market coupling, so where the capacity is still uh, to be nominated. Um, the problem, as I said, is that in that case, the capacity can be used against uh, economic rationale. Um, so um, it can be used uh, against the price differential. Uh, and as we see, there are some borders in which uh, the percentage of the time in which this happens, uh, due to the rules in which capacity is still at present managed um, on those borders, is not irrelevant. 30% of the time, the capacity between the Vietnamese and Ireland is used against the price differential. So even if a price is, say, higher in Ireland than in, the, in Great Britain, uh, capacity is used to transmit energy from Ireland to Great Britain and the other way around. Um, so you can see that still there is a lot of uh, room towards bringing benefit of market integration to consumers by, by ex using ex in a um, proper economic way the existing facilities, in particular the existing capacities in this case. 
this is effectively what is measured by the next slide. Uh, uh, for overall borders in Europe, uh, more than 70% of the time the capacity is used in the right direction, so where the price signal hints that it should be used, but there is still room for improvement in efficiency. Um, last part on which I want to focus on the market monitoring report is the consumer empowerment, which again is a specific area uh, that the Directive 2009-72 specifies that the market monitoring should focus on. And uh, in particular uh, on the uh, application of the, yeah, throughout Europe, of the supply of last resort um, uh, requirement on one hand, and then the evaluation and, um, of the vulnerable con and activity towards vulnerable consumers on the other hand. It's important to say that still there is no common definition of vulnerable consumers. We will return to this. And as a consequence, there is still a very fragmented picture of the uh, uh, market throughout Europe. Uh, supply of last resort, um, you know, it's a, it's a mean to guarantee the universal service obligation. So, uh, where if the consumers do not decide or consumers are left uh, uh, short of suppliers for bankruptcy or whatever reason, uh, the supply of last resort requirement is the requirement that there still should be some uh, supplier that delivers uh, energy to that consumer. The Directive 2009-72 specifies this as a requirement in the for electricity, so there has to be a uh, supply of last, last resort for consumers in Europe for electric consumption, not for gas. There is not such a requirement for gas. And the way in which this um, supply of last resort requirement is implemented in Europe is different. Uh, so you can see that almost all countries, for instance, uh, have specified that this supply of last resort should replace the, the um, uh, failing supplier uh, or the failing uh, DSO uh, in case they fail. Um, there is no such a requirement, uh, or at least in Europe, uh, only half of member states have specified that uh, this requirement should also be intended in the sense that when consumers cannot uh, afford to, uh, to, uh, to be served, there has to be some support. A supporting consumers with payment difficulties, for instance, uh, or when they are inactive in the sense that when they do not switch or change or express any preference towards tariff or, or so on. So again, on this, you can see that uh, in some cases there is a you know, homogenization towards Europe, but some other cases there is not. Uh, and uh, the last slide about the vulnerable Customers uh, in member states, we have seen that uh, um, there is not such a requirement in the directive. So, uh, not all member states have uh, specified uh, neither nor a definition of vulnerable customer, neither uh, a set of initiatives uh, addressed towards these vulnerable customers. Uh, and even for those member states that they have uh, provided the specific definition of vulnerable customers. The initiatives uh, uh, are different, and also the share of vulnerable customers are very different. In some countries, they, they, it is not irrelevant; it's not an irrelevant part of the market. Ten, twelve percent, um, more than a percent in Greece, for instance, or in more than twelve percent in Romania. In some other countries, are more limited, like in Italy, uh, less than four percent, or in, in roughly six percent in France. Some other countries simply do not measure. Uh, um, and do not provide definition and do not measure this uh, problem uh, in the in the market. Okay, so this is um, my presentation is done, um, and now I am uh, open for questions.